howdy doody hope everyone's doing good i'm just gonna get right into it um i can wait a second just a second got this here book terror train uh a long time ago i was friends with this author i don't remember how i met them i think it was through uh this website called poetry hunter uh, i don't think it's still a thing um they liked my poems or whatever, but then, the, long story short, they were a very networking type person. And they helped make all these, uh, what do you call these? Um, not, oh, I guess it's a collection, but a, uh, hold on, what is that word? Y'all, I'm taking a second to figure that out. A, is it compendium? Compendium. A collection of concise but detailed information about particular... Nope, it's not that. Happy Black History Month. Thanks, Chase. <laughs> We're at almost at the end. Man, I just got jump-scared by a rat while making my grilled cheese. What do you got, rats? You gonna eat them? Uh, collection of sorts... I like how the question's written in here on Google, how I would type it. Collection of sorts stories is called... An anthology. There we go. Jump scared by a rat. That's your first jump scare. At whatever age you are now. Happy not birthday anymore. I leave it right in front of a cornfield so it's calm. Oh, live right in front of it. Yeah, I've, I, ooh, that's relatable. I used to live right across from a field like that. My la, uh, when I was at the house, well, two of the houses I grew up in, we had mice. One of them had mice and ants. The other one just had mice and bats occasionally. And then the one with the mice, though, that was next to a field, that one kind of sucked because they're just infinite. I like the jump scare. It was like, hey, man, you making one for me? Can you give me a little tiny cheese? This one has like a comically large amount of stories in there. Bam. Roll look like Remy. Infinite mice and corn. Sounds like a crow's dream. Man, I can't type tonight. Your typing privileges will be revoked. A crow's dream. Crows would love that. All they need is... What's the other thing crows like? They just need some shiny objects. And then they're set. Oh, you know what? I hear an alarm going off. That's what I hear. I'll be right back. No alerts. Wait, come back. I just got here. I had, a, I had my cell phone alarm for midnight going off. Just in case I slept till midnight. That was my plan originally. I'm going to break your wrist if I even ever see you in public. That way you can never type again. It's violent. Me and my bro have stolen corn from the field. That's messed up, bro. Don't steal corn. That's the farmer's plate. Where is Hank? Oh, yeah, we're reading. Joke's on you. I don't leave my home. Hola, senora. The, uh, the corn, I have fun one of that. So there's like, I, as I, how, how I know it or whatever, there's two different kinds of corn. There's corn for humans and then there's stock corn for animals. And when I was a kid, or a teenager rather, this one, one of my groups of friends, they stole a bunch of corn from a stock field. And then they like tried to eat it and it was like not very good. It's like super hard. You had to like boil it for like four hours or steam it for a really long time. We're going to get burgers and listen to you read. Hell yeah. I'm going to get me a book. I'm going to steal... I'm going to steal a car. That's so interesting during the stealing the car dream. What... Did you, did you ever look up the, what that means in dreams? Well, I want to see that one. Like some Freud stuff. He probably didn't have one on cars, but... Dream about... Stolen car. Not that, why does it need my... Okay. This dream indicates that you are concerned about becoming forgotten. A stolen car dream may also signify that you have lately suffered a severe loss. As a result, you have a, had a difficult time adjusting to your current situation. Living has become difficult since you lost your connection, your job, or your contract. My contract? Wait, hold on, I gotta make this more specific. Dream about st a friend stealing a car. Stealing a boyfriend? Wait, hold on, I wanna know that one. No, that one's not specific enough. All right, I gave it over it. 
All right, what, what, is, what about a dream about a burger? I lost my being poor, if that counts. <laughs> that does count. Maybe the poverty is you identified with it. You identified with starvation. If you dream that someone stole your car, it could be an indication that you feel controlled in your waking life by the people around you. It also serves as a warning to avoid untrustworthy friends or colleagues. They may be seeking... To, this is some stuff that, like, uh, like I said that before, like a bad girlfriend would read. Like, <laughs> They may be seeking to encourage you to engage in harmful habits. Tate loves his gossip. I live for sips. For, I want to sip from the tea. I'm just like... We're sitting near a marsh right now. There's marshes? It smells like salt and rotten meat for someone. Or for someone. <laughs> for some reason. That's kind of gnarly. That, Yo, know, that kind of helps though, because it's going to be horror stories. So maybe there'll be stinky smells. It's like uh, 4D. I feel like our dreams reflect our recent experiences. It's either that or what we want, what we're scared of, or what we've experienced in recent times. I feel like that is a bunch of subconscious. Yes, I want Ira to steal my car. That's his, that's his dream. I had a dream about Epstein Island, so <laughs> what's that mean? That's spicy. You know what I dream? What dreams I love? Lesbian ones. I like how she got cut off in that sentence. I think uh, I, I genuinely believe dreams are a good way to see where your consciousness is, but it's also probably the, equi the mental equivalent of like a YouTube poop where it's just cutting together a lot of things that you uh, take in with all your sensory data throughout your time uh, conscious and then piecing it together. And it's up to you. I don't know. The only time I really think about it much is if I feel something like other than the obvious. My dreams center around frogs often. Oh no, hold up, let's find out what dreams about frogs. I know snakes are the... In a nutshell, frog dreams represent change. Frogs are linked to transformation by their unique life cycle. Oh yeah, metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, I don't know what a metamorphosis is. But I want a metaphor for this that makes me feel like frogs is... Dreams is is... Nah, I don't get one. We need frog horror, they probably have that. There is a movie called Frogs that's about a bunch of frogs popping in, like the plague. Depends. What did you do on that island? Yeah, when you know what happened on that island in your dream, dude. I hope you were a janitor. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to talk to you anymore. Uh, yeah, I've, you've been in a couple of my dreams recently, Tate, because I spent so much time on your streams. I always wonder about people that fall asleep with the stream open, because like, whenever I fall asleep with stuff, sometimes that works in there. Usually, it's just the creepy stuff. Like, if you, use, if you leave YouTube um, uh, autoplay on... And depending on your proclivities and how you use it or whatever, for mine, it inevitably ends up on, like, UFO videos where it's the guys, like, and the villagers didn't know where he went. And that's, like, the creepiest thing. Or it's, like, that one meme, the, the giant horse conch is a foot long. <laughs> or whatever. But I always I wonder if I seep into the subconscious. Because occasionally I've had that with Maddie where I was, like, reading at night because that's when I record most of the reading videos. And she'll say something about something that was in one of the stories. And I'm like, am I reading that loud? Brady dreams about Nico taking him up a flight of stairs. Like carrying him? Dang. Nico's, oh wait, I guess Brady's, Brady's been getting in shape. I was about to make a mean joke about Brady. And I refrained. For no reason I was going to make a mean one. Our new apartment is just the sound of blaring frogs. Oh, as you literally live next to Omar. Oh, well, you know... That's intense. Just they're all trying to a bunch of frogs out there trying to get laid, and you don't even appreciate it. Is that why your dreams are frog based now? He's he's getting it's leaking in there, being eaten, vibing with them, being one and and or eating them. Oh, well, it's like the frog cycle. Bust a bus, the giant horse conch. Yeah, that's what he's saying in that video. The what? <laughs> it was like an action sequence of trying to escape onto a boat. Oh, okay. Action. It's, uh, what if they did that? Okay, imagine this. Um, man versus Wild. I think that's Bear Grylls or the other guy, I can't remember. They drop him off on Epstein, and, uh, they're like, I'm here on Epstein's Island. I have to try to escape in 12 hours, or I'm gonna be scarred for life. Bus a bus. Bus a bus. Do we have video redeem? I'll pull up the horse. No. No, sir. I looked, it, I looked it up. That's what, it sa what he says. Bus a bus. Wait, who says bus a bus? Hey, look at that. That timer actually worked for once. That's the first time I've seen it do it without me doing anything. I don't even have any of the other alerts. Look, see, look at this. 
We have a few alerts, but nobody here is going to get to redeem them. Should I get food or sleep? What's the difference? Food is just uh, sleep for your stomach. I'm just going to get into this, though. Or attempt to. No more talk about horse conches. All right, so I haven't... This is like a functionally, this is going to be a cold read because I have not read this story or any of these stories in years. So, I don't know. This might be spicy. There could be spicy stuff in here. I'm going to skip the poetry, though. Want to bet? I can redeem whatever my heart desires. Just a haunch. We need a, a hot read next, like one I've read like a thousand times. Wait, Tate. Before you read. Before you read. Put the book title as text on the screen. Oh, good point. Thank you. All right, we'll take a second to do that real quick. Um, oh, you know what? I'll even... I'm going to put that on there, too. I'll do that. Look, look at there. That's probably a terrible color for the shirt I'm wearing, but that's fine. And then this one. Where's this even at? Wait, what? Oh, I guess I just need a new one. This one's, for whatever reason, not showing up. Delete. Delete. This man closed his store. I was prepared. I've learned my lesson. It was kind of annoying, though, because, like, now I have to open the store up again. <laughs> you can't redeem whatever you want. I was prepared. I have studied the ancient arts of battle. Uh, what is this? Here we go. New. New text. Book. Book. A title. Terror Train. Wait. We. We are reading Terror Train. Yo, can I get a gradient? Can I get an outline? Size? Size. Not that color, though. That is... We need black. Done. Oi. It feels like when Walmart stopped being 24-7. 24 hours? That's a vibe. Yo, I, I kind of hate that. I remember the day I discovered that. Pepsi or cock? Which one? Which one are you drinking? You could have Cock Max or uh, Pepsi Zero. Freddy Fazbear Erotic Fan Fiction oh, on paperback? We're not reading that. <laughs> Calm down. I remember the first time I, I was going to Walmart. It was 2 a.m. And we were trying to get something. Like, we drove to town for this and it was closed. And I'm just like, what is the point? If you're going to, like, destroy the small town and all of the small, uh, small shops and local stores, at least be, like, available all the time. Come on. Give us modern conveniences that justify the disruption of local economies. No, the rewards. How could you? I'd do it again. What if I bribe Maddie to burst into your room and scream, Hell yeah? Why would you do that? I had a joke ready. I'm sorry, Hardys. What would that, would that count as me redeeming a sound? <laughs> no, I was right. My theory is correct. What is your theory? Hold on. Why, you guys have both said that like twice. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. Uh, cock max, let's fucking go. We can trademark that. Uncombed mustache? Oh, yeah, I did not, I did not brush my mustache today. Howdy, Platt. I smoke cigarettes in front of a closed Walmart at 3 a.m. Great times. Hypothermia. If you type wood, the bot replies with the woodchuck shit. Yeah, that's accurate. When you were a baby, did they call you... <coughs> The tater tot? I don't know what they called me. I was a baby. But if I was a baby, I would call them adult tots. But it has a cooldown. Oh, you mean the word. Okay, that was your theory. I'm glad. Uh, that took you. That was the first person to notice. No, not the first person to notice that. I think Shrek figured that, but that took a month. That took a month. I had that. I finally added a thing in there. An auto response, if you will. How much wood would a chuck? Do people think your name is Tate? Joke's on them. Your real name is Randall. Why would you reveal this? 
you know, a wizard loses his power when they, or a demon loses his power, or, or a, everyone loses their power when they don't pay the electric bill. I need, I want the book to be in there. Look at this sick, look right there. Throw a cigarette on this dude. And most people's dad would use him as a profile picture. Maybe he had some top text, bottom text, like, uh, train to born, born to train. Born identity. The people, what is this? Took me a couple streams. Looks better than me, to be honest. Oh, you, which of your followers is the biggest bitch? Twink man, Randall Savage. Twink man? And he would say, heck yeah, friend. And instead of Slim Jims, he would eat soy sticks. Born to shit. Forced to wipe. Yeah, I, I, I could see that on there. And then he's like, welcome to the pain train. First stop, your face. I don't know who the biggest one is. There's a few, though. All right, here we go. We're going into... What is this, right? Of the first transcontinental railroad, departing from Grand Central Station, May 4th, 2019, 9 p.m., Ending in San Francisco, California. Bon voyage dinner. 6 p.m. Is it Ciprani? Ciperani? Or is it Ciperani? We'll never know because I'm not Italian. Uh, 100 to, or I don't speak Italian. I don't think you have to be Italian to know that. I'm sure there's a bunch of people like, I'm part Italian. And they don't, they can't read that. Or, you know. 120 East, 42nd Street, New York. Okay, so I don't always love my job. I hate trains. Ever since I was a kid and my grandmother picked me up every summer and took me to stay with her in Washington, I've had problems with motion sickness. Some people say it helps to ride facing forward. It never helped me. By the time we got to Union Station, I had been there two or three, been through two or three barf bags and was ready to spend the next two days in bed. I can't even stand the subway. I can barely take a bus to work. Put me on a plane with a couple of drinks and a Prozac and wake me up when we get there. And I'm fine. But the mere thought of a train makes me lose my lunch. Grandma gets trains ran on her. Yo, that's a different Christmas song. Grandma had a train ran over by reindeer. But what's a girl to do when she writes about travel for the biggest newspaper in the world? Yo, actually, this made me think this, this, uh, this anthology made me think I have a spicier book. I can't, I can't read that one on Twitch, but I can post a picture of it in Discord when I remember to tomorrow. But what's a girl to do? Oh, apparently I'm a girl character now. All right. Thank you for subscribing. <laughs> Thank you, Wormsicle. Appreciate it, bro. If I was a deep voice enjoyer, I'd go to fuck the bed with stream on the background. Instead, you can stay up and have a nightmare. Hope you had, hope you had a good stream today, bro. But what's a girl to do when she writes about travel for the biggest newspaper in the world? So I have suffered through the Orient Express, the Trans-Siberian Railway, the Mombasa to Na Nairobi nightmare, the Palace on Wheels in India, the Glacier Express in Switzerland, Japan's Shikansi Bullet Train, and the Blue Train in South Africa, and a few others. I'd like to forget. I've even had the occasion to take the New York to Washington Akala. Asala. You have no idea how glad I am they don't have the Chattanooga Choo Choo anymore. Otherwise, I might be barfing all the way to Tennessee. Eight to the bar. Even with the violin. Acupressure bands, drama main, bio nine, peppermint tea, cool compress, and a battery operated fan, and music on headphones. I never f fail to spend at least two visits per day paying homage to the porcelain goddess. That's a good way to refer, refer to a toilet. Thanks, got my car fixed finally. Car fix. Man, I I don't know if you have to fix. It. I don't fix my car because it's I don't have I don't I don't think my car fucks, but. I understand. They probably calm down a lot too after you get it fixed. Chattanooga Choo Choo is one of my grandma's signature moves. That's like where she like feeds you with a wooden spoon and if you don't take a bite, she hits you with it. I've seen therapists try to biofeedback. You name it. Trains and I will never be friends. I tried to talk my way out of this one, but my editor just wouldn't hear it. He gave me a front page preview piece of the Sunday travel section and guaranteed me a large follow-up piece as long as I promised to leave out the parts about the projectile... Vomiting? Oh, gross. He also offered me a raise and a week's paid vacation in Paris. What's a girl to do? The idea of spending a week at George's, George's Five and treated like a goddess was just too hard to resist. 
So after answering my last email message, a note from my best friend wishing me a retching good time. <laughs> Hilarious. I logged off, grabbed my rolling suitcase, finished the last of my coffee, and headed for Chipirani. Okay, I'm not going to keep destroying that. Watch it never come up again. She. C. Do, do, do. Repaired. Oh, Cipriani, get the heck out of here. Wait, no, I don't want to practice block. Let's see, listen to this, guys. Cipriani. Cipriani? You know what? I'm done with language. I before C after E. In the weeks up to the trip, I'd gotten several letter letters from train buddies. Oh, this, this joke could just go forever. There are a whole bunch of train aficionados who go on these special trips and take I take and report on. I've made many train friends. One of them even promised me he had developed the perfect cure for my train sickness, and he guaranteed me I was going to have a fabulous trip without tossing my cook cookies once. Even so, I planned to skip lunch at C. Pirani, and that would be hard. I love C. Pirani. Usually, I manage to toss back a couple glasses of red wine along with one of their amazing pasta dishes and save room for something gooey and chocolate. But this time, I'll wander around. I do a few quick interviews, maybe hit the champagne just a little, and then head over to Grand Central and board the train early to meet, to meet my traveling photographer, Honoree Eddie Martin, to interview my Pullman porter for the trip. Poor guy. He had no idea what he was in for. I checked my suitcase and walked into a room that contained a lot of familiar faces, train aficionados. No way they were going to miss this one. The first person who greeted me in Cipirani was... Billy Bob Acer, a Texas oil man. Billy Bob and his wife, Betty Sue, do a lot of train trips. I bet they do. I take and report on. Billy Bob is the grandson of a hobo who rode the rails back in the 30s and worked his way up to ownership of one of the biggest oil companies in Texas. His wife, Betty Sue, was terrible motion sickness. Has terrible motion sickness. We spent many an afternoon taking turns in the commode. She really should stay home when he trains. I don't know whether it's because she loves him madly, or she doesn't trust him, or maybe a combination of both. Wait, who we got here? I want to I wanna give this son of a bitch a voice. Hold on. Well, if it isn't Brenda Starr in the New York Times going with us tonight, just kidding. That's why I brought along another bottle of elixir I worked out for Betty Sue. I'm proud to say it works just fine. We trained home from Atlanta to Dallas last month, and the little woman didn't even get nauseous. Here she is now. Betty Sue, tell Brenda all about the new train juice I came up with for you. Betty Sue sauntered over, holding a glass of champagne, wearing about a million dollars in diamonds, and a cheap satin windbreaker with the ace of hearts and the ace of spades and the locomotive embroidered on the back. On the top, it had their names. On the bottom, it said, The Two Aces. It was cute, but somehow I got the feeling she would rather have been wearing Versace. Typical. I'm not mature enough to listen to this. Listen, there's going to be lots and lots of trains, dude. Like the, the as seen on TV VHS tape box. Brenda. Uh, that's a weird voice for Nah, fuck it. Brenda. She yelled and hugged me so hard. Some of the champagne spilled onto my black suit. Brenda Starr traveled tip number one. Always travel in black. And always in a suit so you can take the jacket off if you need to clean off stains. That way you arrive nice and fresh and don't enter a classy establishment looking like a bag lady who slept sitting up all the way. Betty Sue reached into her enormous Birkin bag and handed me a bottle. It looked like bootlegging gone wrong, horribly wrong. It contains ginseng, chamomile, peppermint tea, a touch of almond extract, some rare Chinese herbs, a touch of Gatorade from the electrolytes, a little blood orange juice, and a small amount of Tennessee sipping whiskey. You should see, you should take a dose now and one when the train gets moving, then one in the morning, and one of lunch. Take it with a dry cracker, take it with dry crackers. I almost called her a name. It's worked so well on Betty Sue. We're thinking of patenting it. God damn it. I wish they told me who the fuck was saying this, because I think this is a husband now. I'm already... <laughs> We're thinking of patenting it. It works and you write about it in your column. We'll cut you 15% in perpetuity. We could make you a very rich lady. I smelled it. It smelled pretty vile. 
And it was inside a vial. It was like a double. I've been trolled. It didn't even say who was saying that, bro. I'm so I'm so trolled. I'm so <laughs> trolled. This is why cold reads suck. Uh, and I wasn't sure if those were some dead powdered insects crawling around in it, but I was pretty I was pretty adventurous eater. You kind of have to be to be a world traveler. And so I stopped a waiter, grabbed two crackers, scraped off the caviar, and swallowed. I followed it with a gulp of the potion. I came close to hacking right then and there. But after five minutes, the feeling was gone, and I was feeling pretty good. I had two glasses of champagne, and even managed to find the pastry cart and hide in the corner with something to feed the chocolate monster in me. Oh, I got a little chocolate monster. And then I saw him walking toward me. I checked to make sure I didn't have any chocolate on my face. He was tall, dark-haired, slightly graying at the temples, and had a blue eye the color of a blue eye. Okay, a blue eye, the color of the water gracing many a loo into which I had made deposits while on trains or bus trips. Yes, I. Oh, damn, even the author caught me. The other one was covered with a black leather patch. The good one had eyelashes as long as they cast a shadow over his face. So long they casted a shadow over his face, they made it look like we were talking through the bars of a prison visiting day. Damn, he looked like a Latina. <laughs> Bro had the fucking... <laughs> He had the, the caterpillars. Something about this guy was bad. And if there's something I love more than chocolate, it's guys who are bad. Uh, like, them, like them bad boys. Come and get her. He sat opposite of me and pushed the rest of my dessert away. You don't need this. You're sweet enough. He said in a thick accent. Oh, I'm sorry. It's supposed to be that. What's, what accent do I go with here? Stop. Oh no. Well, I don't know. I'll just mush it. You don't need it. You don't need it. It's sweet enough. He said in a thick accent. The one that you used to say, Bond. James Bond. It didn't even told me the accent. Bro, I'm not even reading. I don't even know how to read. Okay. So the pickup line sucked, but the accent had me long about the second syllable. Had me long about the second syllable. I tittered politely. It wasn't mine. It was, it was here when I sat down. I moved on quickly before he could call me out on that one. So, are you here for the big transcontinental railroad trip? Yes, he replied. Quite the train buff, actually. But teaching prevents me from taking as many train trips as I'd like. It just keeps going, dude. Of course, I've managed a few. The Orient Express, naturally, the Trans-Siberian, the High Ram Bingham to Machu Picchu. The Gone between Alice and Darwin was one of my favorites. Have you done that one? Actually, I'd begged off of that, of that one about a year earlier. They sent someone else. No, I missed that one, but I have done the Blue Train, the Palace of Wheels, the Andean Explorer, and several others. Even ridden the Sh Shikansi... Chickenson, bullet train in Japan. Yes, I love trains. He smiled in a scholarly way, put his chin on his hand, and leaned in. And how is it you have time for such adventures? My God, he was gorgeous. I could barely get a word out. I'm, uh, I'm a travel reporter for the New York Times. I cover the most glamorous trips in the world and write about them. Maybe you've seen my byline, Brenda Lynn Starr? Oh, yes. You were on the Antarctic cruise that became icebound a few years ago. I read your recent piece about the anniversary cruise you took through the Panama Canal. Well played. Not much chance of getting frozen in down there. I chuckled. <laughs> True, but I didn't breathe until the ship was safely through those locks. I was terrified about having to be rescued again. So how is it you're able to take so many train trips? I asked. Eyeing the dessert longingly. That's exactly the sound I make when I chuckle. <laughs> I'm a professor at Cambridge. I teach literature. I use school vacations and sabbaticals to travel. Ah, so you're an English professor. I wrinkled my nose at the bad joke. I bet you've heard that a million times. A few, he replied. But never quite as enchantingly as you sounded coming from you. Actually, I'm a Scottish English professor, but I guess to you Americans, we all look the same. 
What does that even mean? <laughs> he smiled, and the way that blue eye crinkled at the corner took my breath away. Maybe this was going to be an interesting trip after all. I stood up from the table, and he stood too. Why don't American men do that? I blame their mothers. Oh, we're all supposed to fucking stand every time somebody stands. You know, she should go on a plane. Motherfuckers be standing as soon as that shit lands. Well, I have to head over to the train now. My photographer's waiting for me. He already boarded. I have an interview scheduled with my pull, with my pull man porter before things get really busy. I glanced down at the chocolate. Sorry I hadn't gotten to finish it. But not sorry for that distraction that prevented that from happening. Perhaps we'll see each other during the trip. I've learned midnight supper tonight is formal. I'll look for you, I said sweetly. He shook, he took my hand and kissed it. As I shall for you, too. American men don't do much of that, either. With that, I swept out of the room, my red ponytail bouncing behind me, hopefully making a good impression on. I realized then that he hadn't told me his name. I smiled. I looked to the heavens and spoke. Well, Granny, it looks like your Brenda Starr just found herself a mystery man. I grabbed my wheeler from the check-in and headed across the street to Grand Central Station. Joe Mama. Grand Central Station. A Grand Central or Grand Central Terminal, as it was more properly called. Covers 49 acres of prime New York City real estate at the corner of Park Avenue and East 42nd Street. It was scheduled for demolition a while back, but a group led by Jackie O saved it. Like she was ever actually inside it. It was a pretty crappy place back then, but they fixed it up. Now it's just crowded, but the oyster bar is to die for. I took a deep breath and pushed on the doors. Here it came. Another three days and four nights of almost non-stop barfing. Why is it I can throw up for three days and never lose an ounce? As I entered the building, a wave of dizziness came over me. I stopped to catch my breath, then something hit me on the middle of my stomach. I gasped and closed my eyes tightly. It snaked around my body and disappeared into the floor. It felt like a prickling... T Sorry, I had a sneeze. That was, uh... Call me sneezy. <laughs> Where were we at? Prickling, a prickling tingle, like electricity, surged around me. It took a moment before I could open my eyes. When I did, I immediately noticed there was something in front of my face, like I had walked through a large spider web. I reached up and pulled it away and discovered it attached to something on my head. A hat? I wasn't wearing one when I left Cipriani. Who wears hats? I touched it. My hair. The long red ponytail was gone. <clears throat> it was short and curly. How was that possible? Thanks for the blessing. Panicking, I looked around the huge room. Everything was black and white. Bright white light streamed through the celery store windows, high on the walls, pulling onto the jet black floor as people hurried across it. Huge strong beams of light, like spotlights outside of Hollywood premiere. I recognized it at once, this iconic photo of the station in the 1930s. I reached out to grab the handle of my roller and discovered I was carrying a small, hard-sided makeup case and a handbag I, couldn't be, I wouldn't be caught dead with. My travel pantsuit was replaced with a printed dress that fell beneath my knees. I could tell I was wearing, ho wearing hose. The tips of them were sticking out of a pair of peep-toe platform shoes. This was not good. I ran to the newsstand, grabbed the newspaper, and read the headlines. Lou Gehrig, end streak of two, uh, 2130, Union Station opens in Los Angeles. Oh, it's spelled Las. Las Angeles. And total lunar eclipse visible in Far East. None of those things happened. I look at the date. May 4th, 1939. How is that possible? I put the newspaper down. Somehow, three lattes with extra shots, a couple of glasses of champagne, and a hit of Billy Bob's train juice had me hallucinating. My entire body was trembling. Maybe if I turned around, walked out the station, and walked back in again, my head might clear up. A little fresh air might just do it. I turned around and walked straight into the mystery man, dressed in a pinstripe suit and a fedora hat. There you are, darling. I paid the taxi driver and had the red cap take our luggage to the compartment. He reached into his vest and retrieved a pocket watch on the chain, clicking it open. We're a little early. We don't have to board for another three quarters of an hour. Shall we go find a bookstore? 
I'm sure you'll want something to read on the train. Did he see it too? Or was it just me? Had this whole world just morphed into something from the Twilight Zone? If so, he wasn't mentioning it. And exactly how does one bring that subject up? Exactly who are you? What have you done with my roll-on? Why is the entire world black and white? And why is it 1939? I decided to let it go a little longer and see what happened. I don't like to jump into things too quickly. Besides, he mentioned a bookstore and took me by the hand. What was I supposed to do? We walked around until we found a shop. My feet were killing me. We walked in and I gasped. Shelves full of books like The Hobbit, Of Mice and Men, Rebecca, Tropic of Cancer, The Unvanquished, Death on the Nile, To Have and Have Not. Northwest Passage. I took a copy of Rebecca off the shelf. It was a first edition in mint condition. Oh, that kind of rhymes. First condition in first edition in mint condition. I was standing in the middle of a small town, world, a room filled with books worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. First editions by the most famous authors of the 20th century. Hemingway, Faulkner, Williams, Fitzgerald, Christie, Hammett. The list went on and on. Holy shit, I said. I'm sorry, darling, the mystery man said from the other side of the store. Did you say something? Um, no. I said, gathering up a pile and taking them to the counter. Suddenly it occurred to me that this wasn't my handbag, and even if it was, they didn't have plastic in 1939. The mystery man came up behind me and put his arm around my waist, kissing me on the throat. In a store? Ooh. Darling, I know you're a librarian and love books, but seriously, you don't think you'll need all this reading on our honeymoon, do you? I felt my heart stop. A honeymoon? I was married to this guy? I didn't even know his name. And when I did, when did I become a librarian? I was flying by the seat of my pants. Wait, I'm not even listening. This is about some person traveling back to the past or some shit. Yes, they have, uh, they've traveled back. All right, hold on. We're going to find out how far they traveled back. Uh, I felt my heart stop. Honeymoon? I was married to this guy? I didn't even know his name. And when, when did I become a librarian? I was flying, burn. I was flying by the seat of my pants. Oh no, I don't expect to get all of them on this trip, but... I've been wanting to buy these titles. I'm sure you'll let me get them sooner or later. What I really hoped was that when I woke up in 2019, I'd still have the books, a shelf of brand new first editions, would be to die for. Okay, he said to the sales girl. Wrap them up, but sweetheart, you really need to start letting me pay for things for you. I am your husband now. I took another look at the mystery man. He was hot as hell. This trip just got a lot more interesting. We boarded the New York Central and met, and met by our Pullman Porter, a dark-skinned man with wiry gray hair. He tipped his hat and greeted us. Good evening to you, Miss Blackwood. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, these? My boobies? Okay. My massive fucking titties? I didn't fix that my one. My stuffed milkies? My hunker bunkered oinky boinkies? My fucking Howdy, pain. stretching wind flapping Hope you're doing good. welling sex mounds? Almost had it. What? I didn't even stop that. You won't stop me? I won't. I can't. Cannot stop. It cannot contain the beast. I thought about it, but didn't want to give your secrets away. Oh, okay. All right. Well, now I know what team you're playing on. Oh, hold on. Where was I? Oh, yeah. We get to do a good evening to you, Miss Blackwood, sir. I hope so. I show hope so I was pronouncing that correctly. And a good evening to you, missus. Your compartment is just down there. Walk this way. Hell yeah. This is what we live for. He took my bag back from me and turned and shuffled down the hall, leaving us to follow. I tried not to laugh. Not even Richard Pryor would get away with an act like that in 2019. 2019. I was tempted to stoop over and shuffle behind him. Here we goes, Mr. Blackwoods, he said, opening the door. Sitting my travel case inside and handling, handing the mystery man, Mr. Blackwoods, the key. The mystery man flipped him a shiny quarter. The pullman porter took off his hat in time to catch it inside. Thank you, sir. Now remember, if you be needing anything, you just ring for old Titus, sir, and I'll be coming running. I have a great trip. He shuffled down the hall, putting the quarter in his pocket and singing to himself. 
If you got a shiny quarter, you can tell the Pullman Porter. Turn our lights real slow. Oh, oh, oh. Then we're going to shuffle, shuffling off to Buffalo. Go. Oh. I don't want to give them away to chat. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, we're we're part way through. I'll just catch you up. If you have this going, if you even care remotely, we are in a train. This lady was going on a supposed to go on a train expedition in 2019, and she went into a fucking door, and it took her back to 1939. She and this everything is in black and white. And just this mystery man that she uh, does not know that she's apparently married to, or is about to be married to, or did get married. Never mind, they are married because this is they're about to go on their honeymoon. Honeymoon on a train. Could you imagine running a train on your honeymoon? Come on, my love. I know this isn't our home, but I'd still like to carry you over the threshold. He dropped the parcel of books on the floor inside and swept me into his arms. I hope you don't mind that I had the beds made up. We have time before dinner, and I thought we could. Well, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I did know. And the champagne and Texas train juice was beginning to make me mighty horny. Hey, this was, 20, this was 2019. At least it was when I woke up that morning. And women were liberated. I even carried my own condoms in my handbag. Although I had absolutely no clue where my Chanel bag was, and that made me damn mad. I blew a whole year of bonuses and profit sharing on that purse on a trip to Paris. And now it was eight, 80 years in the future, probably picked up by some bag lady in the station and pawned for 50 bucks. Behind me, Mr. Blackwoods, no first name yet, was fussing around in one of the trunks. He handed me something white and fluffy. Darling, put this on for me, please. Ever since you brought this, you've had no idea how I've dreamed of seeing you in it. Oh, yes, dear. I said, picking up my handbag and taking the lingerie from him. I think I'll just go inside and freshen up. It was a good excuse to rifle through the handbag for clues. And condoms. Yo, I bet 1939 condoms probably sucked. They were probably like, probably give you cancer. They'll probably give you dick cancer. Or pussy cancer, I guess, because like, they had them in shitty. They are just like made out of like, just oil. Like not even processed. <laughs> like... It turns out she's a woman of color in Germany. No, 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 no. This one's in New York. This one, good point. That'd be terrible. Yeah, you wake up on a train. You wake up on a, in a train in 1939. Sounds like a bad, bad year to wake up on a train. Ooh. All right, condoms. Uh, according to the papers inside, my name was Diana Warner. I lived in Manhattan, worked at the New York Public Library, and was 27. In an envelope, I found a marriage license. I, Diana Warner, had married Brendan Blackwoods of Cambridge, England, that very morning at City Hall, which was kind of funny since I'd only met him at dinner. He called out to me. We're dressing for the midnight supper tonight. If you don't mind, I'll choose something for you and have the Pullman Porter press it. I'll be choosing your clothes a lot now. After all, I am your husband. You did, not, you did promise to love and honor and obey. Like hell I would. Yeah, bad year for a black guy. I don't know if that's the one I would go with, but sure. I took off my dress, only to find out I was wearing a girdle. Oh, hell yeah, that's some classic a girdle. You know, everyone had to have been hot as shit back then with all these layers of clothes. What the hell? Did I look like someone who needed a girdle? I went to Krav Maga class two nights a week and hit the gym another three. Then I looked in the mirror. My 1930s body... A little bit different. I had less boobage, my waist was smaller, but my hips were decidedly wider. I wondered if I could sleep in the girdle. Sighing, I slipped into the negligee. It was white satin, low cut in the front and almost backless. The coat, trimmed in marabo. And I had a, tra had a train that I doubted would fit in the compartment from one end to the other. I took off my silly looking hat and started wondering what I would look like as a platinum blonde. I patted my curls and said, Come up and see me sometime. And my best Mae West. Hey, if you're going to hallucinate, you might as well enjoy it. But when I found that snake oil making cowboy Billy Bob, I was going to kick his sorry ass from the engine to the caboose. When I opened the bathroom door, Brendan, the mystery man, had changed into a black silky pajamas and a velvet robe. It was, well, it was black and white like everything else. I stifled a giggle. 
made that make that a guffaw. No man I'd ever been with owned a robe, except for the guy back in that guy back in college who liked to do Ian Anderson impressions. You look m magnificent, he said. The accent made me wet. Whoo, we're getting, getting in that oh, this is a spicy. Come and show me the gown. Made it back to silver lobbies. Right now, we're in the wood, the paper lobbies. He was kind of too late on the coming part. Wait, what? Oh, okay, on the coming part. The voice gave me a little O. Oh. As for the gown, I practically tripped over it. I'm not exactly a red carpet kind of girl. He swept me into his arms and tossed me onto the bed, standing above me and belted his robe and tossed it away. I slid out of mine and tossed it away too. 1939 sex was strange. All that stuff about I Love Lucy was absolutely true. Neither one of us ever took our clothes off. We did it in the dark, a novelty for me. And don't ask me how, but he managed to keep one foot on the floor at all times. He wasn't even in the same zip code as my G-spot, but he seemed to enjoy himself. If things were going to stay black and white, Diana had to teach a lot to teach this guy. There was a knock on the door and he shrugged on his robe to answer it. It was Titus with our evening clothes. The hubby was going to be wearing a white dinner jacket. I could see that. He'd chosen brocade for me. It was black. I was getting somewhat sick of black. I slid out of bed, practically landing on my newly plump ass on the floor with that, all that satin, took the dress and headed back into the bathroom to change. Believe me, the girdle went on first. I was not being caught dead with hips like that. I have to admit, I looked pretty good as a 1930s vamp. I did miss the red hair, though. <laughs> oh, God. I'm not as good, but I'm gold blood. Add me. I'll consider. I mean, you, so consider horrible ping. Not gonna lie. Gonna fall asleep to Tate's voice is soothing. Oh, shit. Depends on the region. Shouldn't be too bad. Oh, they're bad. Which part of EU? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can tell he's American. Because that's the way he is. Oh, let me find myself again. Exiting the teeny bathroom with a little sway of my hips, I was shocked to see him in a white dinner jacket and a black tie with a black and white plaid kilt, complete with a very hairy sporin. A nurse. A nurse, you pervs. A nurse. Oh, like a... Okay, anyway, a nurse. I have to admit I had another little O. Oh, better than the one he gave me in bed. I do, I do so love a man in a kilt. Uh, I once spent an entire week in Scotland with damp panties, wondering if they really did go commando. And there's a sentence I never thought I'd read in my entire life. We saw Shade into the dining room, arm in arm. Him in his kilt and me in this black orchid corsage and white gloves up to my shoulders with diamond cuffs on both hands. Were they diamonds? Did college professors, college professor, must know the did College professors make enough to give their wives diamonds. Anyway, he looked pretty swanky, as they used to say back in the day. There were the same people I just had dinner with at Cipriani. Uh, Cipriani, all decked out in vintage clothes and acting like there wasn't a single thing wrong with the world being black and white. Billy Bob and Betty Sue looked like a formal Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. They saw me and headed to my, in my direction. Surely they would know I wasn't Diane Warner. They must have known that something was terribly wrong. Billy Bob grabbed a couple of glasses of champagne and headed over to where we were standing. Ah, Mr. and Mrs. Blackwoods. I didn't think the two of you would make it to supper tonight after the morning's festivities at City Hall. We'd figured you'd be pretty much keeping to yourselves. Brandon chuckled. And miss the gala send off supper? We wouldn't hear of it. This is the highlight of the trip. I was glad to hear that because our little foray in the compartment sure wasn't a highlight. We strolled around arm in arm, greeting the guests. All of them had the same names they did in 2019, and yet they all greeted me as Diana and congratulated me on my recent nuptials. Apparently the two aces had stood up for us. All news to me. Billy Bob gave Brandon, the mystery man, lots of nudges and pokes in the ribs, accompanied by a lot of rude remarks about sex that sounded like stuff 12-year-olds 12 12 -year say in 2019. I rolled my eyes and hit the champagne hard. 
Maybe if I could get drunk enough, color would come back to the world, and I would return to 2019 and Brenda Lynn Star. I gotta try that technique. We in that smart arena? Yes, we are. Do do arm and arm, arm and arm. Yeah, it's me. It is you. I have to admit, I had a pretty. I was pretty hammered when I left the dinner party to return to their apartment. Old Titus was waiting outside to inform Massa. <laughs> Goddamn, she did it. Massa Blackwoods of the beds were made and turned down, and to collect another shiny quarter. He headed down the hall singing 25 cents richer. Sex wasn't much better the second time, although the champagne made me a little bolder. Oh my, Mr. Blackwoods, where did you learn to do that? Oh wait, is that him? He asked, oh wait, she's not fucking the, 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 the bad guy. Hold on. <laughs> oh my, Mrs. Blackwoods, where did you learn to do that? He asked, blushing. Hey, it wasn't like I invented being on top. Had I? <laughs> Maybe I had. Then his body shuddered all over when I tossed in a little hand job. His first. Pretty wasted on the champagne. Mrs. Blackwoods, you are positively swacked, he said. It didn't take... I like that. Swacked. You are positively swacked, he said, had said. It didn't take me long to fail, fall asleep. Surprisingly, not once did I feel the urge to toss my cookies. The rumbling of the train sounded soothing, almost like a lullaby. Even the cramped space didn't seem to bother me, and soon I was gone, dreaming in black and white about being in Busby Berkeley's 42nd Street. I was a little understudy, who stepped into the lead after she accidentally on purpose set a tripwire right outside the leading lady's dressing room. I was a huge success. I was just taking my final curtain call and receiving bouquets of black and white roses when there was a knock on the door. Miss Blackwoods, Mrs. Blackwoods. Get dressed and come quick. Something terrible's happened. The engineer wants everyone to gather the obs observation car right away. Oh my lord, in all my years in this here train, I ain't ever need seen nothing like this happen ever. Hurry, please. It was old Titus, and he sounded very upset. I grabbed my robe and got up. Was there a fire on the train? Excuse me for that guttural sound right there. Uh, what could have happened? I reached over the nut. I reached over to nudge the mystery man and noticed he was gone. Had I slept through Titus's first call? No, that was impossible. Even drunk, I'm a light sleeper. I doubt he would have left the bride behind. I dug through my trunk and found a pair of white high-waisted trousers and a black short sleeve cashmere sweater. Pure Lauren Bacall. Just the thing to wear to an emergency. As I was leaving the compartment, I bumped into Brandon. Oh my god, I said. Have you heard the news? We're all supposed to meet in the observation car. Mm, yes, he said a bit anxiously. I was out having a smoke. I didn't want to wake you. I heard the news and came back to find you. He grabbed my hand. Hurry, darling. Blackwoods, like blunt raps? Oh, it could be. He's, he's the blunt rap. He's the blunt man who can make some grass, make it nice and sweet. I need more liquids. I might have to go make more hot water. And here we are. When we arrived at the car, there was a large ring of people standing around a seat in the middle of the car. Brandon held my hand and pushed us through the crowd. There was a woman sitting there. Her eyes were wide open and she was staring straight ahead. It didn't take a CSI person to see she was dead. Anybody know who it is? Brandon asked, taking charge. That'd be Missy Ellen Parker. Titus said. Her compartment is next to yours. Who is she traveling with? Alone, I said. She's a gym teacher from New Hampshire. A big fan of trains since she was a child. She frequently takes train trips, always alone. She took a vacation week. She didn't want to miss this one. How do you know that? A passenger asked. I had to think fast. She was dead. She wasn't going to contradict my story. She introduced herself to me at dinner. Well, from the looks of it, someone strangled her, another passenger said. Probably snuck up behind her and got the drop on her. I d who would say that? Just piss in a cup. 
and make your own make your own drinks make your own tea you you are you are pretty much a, a tea a tea machine i'd taken about 6 train trips with Ellen parker she was a gym teacher who lived with a woman in conway new hampshire she was one of those kind of gym teachers taught self defense to women and was strong as an ox no way she would let someone sneak up on her and strangle her without putting up one hell of a fight and mo most likely would have won I don't think so, I said. There's no sign of struggle. No scratches on her arms. Oh, everyone actually is a CSI person on the train. Her clothing wasn't disheveled. If someone was trying to strangle you, you fight. Maybe someone stabbed her, dragged her here, and set it up like she was sitting here. Another CSI fan, or in 1939, I guess would be Dick Tracy. There's no blood, Brendan said. They cleaned it up, Dick Tracy suggested. It was a linoleum floor, but still, that would have been a lot of blood to clean up, and the floor looked immaculate. He cleaned it all up then, then threw the rags off the train. Where'd he get rags from? Billy Bob asked. Poison? Dick Tracy wasn't going to give up. Nobody else got sick at supper, I said. I know, he said. She wasn't feeling well, so she asked her Pullman porter to bring her a nightcap. It was poisoned. Titus got in a tizzy. Mister... I've been riding this here train for the past 35 years, delivered a lot of nightcaps to a lot of people, and not one of them was ever poisoned, and I'd swear on that on my mama's grave, Mammy's grave, sighed as if an, I took a poison drink to the, her compartment, how'd it get here, here, oh, he's calling it out, she got at least 75 pounds on me, he was right, she clocked a good 225, most of it muscles. Born with a whistle around her neck and sweat socks, she was probably the kind of gym teacher who wasn't afraid to bust into the boys' room when she smelled smoke and drag some poor kid down to the principal's office by their ears. She probably went up and down the shower room and opened the curtains to make sure the girls were really taking showers. I shuddered just drinking, thinking about it. Okay, so maybe you didn't poison her? What do you think happened? Who killed her? Titus walked closer to where the body was sitting and looked at her up and down. Well, she looks pretty white, even for a white woman... I'd say she was a vampire. Okay. Now, we've gone way beyond PC and entered the grounds of some serious racism. There's no such thing as vampires, Betty Sue said. Oh, yes, there are, Titus said, the whites of his eyes doubling in size. <laughs> Why aren't you famous yet? The same reason I still need to drink this water. I don't know. Where are we at? Oh, come back. Vampires, vampires. All right, so we got right now the uh, dead woman on the train. We've time traveled back. Dead woman on the train. The suggestion that, that it's a vampire. Back home in Louisiana, we got them. They comes out at night and drinks blood. That's why she's so white. Someone done drank her blood. Then there should be two little holes in the side of her neck. Take the scarf she's wearing off and see, Dick Tracy said. Why didn't he just do it himself, the big wuss? The whites of Titus' eyes got even wider. Titus ain't touching no dead body. Y'all ain't got, got enough quarters to make me do that. <laughs> I like the idea that he touches that body and they just give him a, a quarter. Like, that's his fucking tip for uh, hanging out with that. We could just prick her finger and see if she has any blood left, Dick Tracy said. That would probably prove it wasn't a vampire. Oh, holy jumping hell, Billy Bob said, ripping the scarf off from her throat. Betty Sue and most of the women in the room screamed. There were two teeny holes in the side of her throat. A small amount of blood oozed out. Her head lolled to one side, and she fell over the, on the seat. Told you so, Titus yelled, practically jumping out of his skin. It's the vampires come back. Had's one on this train in Aug 9, and now he's back. Back? I said. When you came to get us, you said you'd never seen anything like this happen before. Not looking good for Titus. By the time the engineer had arrived on the scene, we had one what not nine? I didn't, missus. I wasn't more than a boy then. Hid the baggage car the whole time. Scared the bejesus out of me. Made sense. I, and I thought I had nailed him. A vampire, so. And now he don't come back and took this white woman's blood. The engineer leaned over the body, the two holes in her throat clearly visible. Who did this? He asked. I like to imagine that he's like doing it like a like when you have dogs, like a do one of the dogs like 
like break something or shits in the house. And you're like, who did this? And they're like a little sad wag over to you. And then you write them a reprimand and dishonorably discharge them. He asked, duh, are all the train engineers high on cocaine? The vampire did. And before the night is through, he may strike again. Titus and knees were knocking together. His white gloved hands clenched below his chin. Stop the train, someone yelled. We can't stop the train, the conductor said. We're meeting the train from the west coast to Promontory Point. It's all been arranged. The president will be there and everything. It's time down to the last minute. I got a big burp. We're free again. We're liberated, in fact. Safe. But aren't we leaving the scene of a crime? Dick Tracy said again. The engineer took his head. <coughs> the engineer shook his head. He didn't take his head. That'd be a completely different story. From the looks of her, the actual scene of the crime was about a couple hundred miles back. No, wait. This is the scene of the crime. We're taking it with us. We'll figure it all out when we get to Utah. For now, everybody go back to your rooms and lock your doors. Is anyone armed? Me and Betty Sue have been sleeping with the matching pearl-handled pistols underneath our pillows. Since our wedding night. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. Billy Bob said, but we ain't got no silver bullets. Titus, run down to the kitchen and grab all the garlic we have. People, if you have more than one crucifix, would you mind sharing? You'll be safe inside your locked rooms. I looked at Brandon. No way I was going to be locked in a room with a complete stranger. A stranger who was conveniently out of smoking out smoking at the time of the crime. Hold on a minute, I said. That means that if one of us is the vampire, one of us is going to be locked in a room with him. Wouldn't it be better if we all stayed together? You know, safety in numbers? Who says the vampire's a man? Brandon asked. They usually are, I replied. Okay, well, maybe not in those B-movies at the drive-ins. Still, I vote we all sleep here. That means we'd all be sleeping with a vampire, a woman cried out. So we take turns keeping watch, I said. We'll have the garlic and the crucifixes and two pearl-handled pistols. Somewhere on this train, there has to be a hammer and something we can use to make a stake. Just make sure you put Ellen on ice and lock her up in case she turns. One vampire is all we can handle right now. Well, I know Billy Bob isn't a vampire, so we're going back to our own room, Betty Sue said. My husband isn't a vampire either, another woman said. That's not the point, I was getting desperate. Don't they turn into smoke or something and slide underneath your door? I read that once. Or what if they turn into bats and fly through the transom over your door? Didn't you ever read the book? They have ways of getting in and out of the locked rooms. I think it was Edgar Allan Poe and it was a monkey, not a vampire, the mystery man said. Damn literature professors. Okay, so maybe it was, but we still need to stick together. One of us is sleeping with a vampire, right? How will you be able to live with yourself if that person wakes up tomorrow sucked dry? Honey, all of us have been married to our spouse for a long time, and we ain't been sucked dry yet, Betty Sue said. Poor woman. She had no idea what she was missing. <laughs> that just leaves you two newlyweds, and Bill and Frank there, and I don't know what their deal is, Billy Bob added. We know you, but we don't know how much about that we don't know much about that English English professor you married. You only asked us to stand up for you last night when we arrived in New York. Scottish, I said. Huh? Scottish English professor. He's not English. Well, neither was Dracula, Dick Tracy added. Just because you're not Romanian doesn't mean you can't be a vampire. I was just saying, he's Scottish. I have no clue if they have Scottish vampires. In fact, I have no clue who the vampire is. Hell, until a few, min until a few minutes ago, I didn't even believe in vampires. I haven't seen you people in a while. Maybe one of you became a vampire since our last train trip. You know? She's right, the mystery man added. First smart thing he'd said all evening. Technically, it is possible that two of you traveling together are both vampires. Oh lord, end of days, Titus cried out. And then there was the crew. And then there's the crew. Anybody new on this trip, Titus? A new Pullman porter? Someone new in the kitchen? A new conductor? The engineer looked pale. Uh, actually, there are three new members of the crew. He right, Titus said. 
And come to think of it, I ain't seen the new Pullman Porter since we left New York. Something strange about him, too. Gives me the heebie-jeebies. When he gets shaked my hand, when he shakes my hand, he has these beetle little eyes, oh lord. I get in a bad case of the willies just thinking about him. Okay. It was official. I had just entered Amos and Andy meet Dracula territory. Time to bust a move. Okay. Everybody's split up into groups of four. Go back to your compartments and bring back all the blankets and pillows. And... Any religious artifacts you might have. Crucifixes, whatever you have. Titus, organize the Pullman porters and round up the crew. We need to see who's accounted for and who is missing. While you're at it, round up any hammers and mallets you can find. Have the kitchen crew bring some big knives for whittling. And wood. We need wood. And food. Meet back here in 15 minutes. Then we sail off this car and hunker down. It's almost morning. Don't vampires go to sleep in the morning? What about me? The engineer said. I have a crew up front and we gotta run this train. And there's a new guy up there too. Kick him out. Lock him in a compartment or something. And somebody get rid of this body before she becomes a vampire too. There was a flurry of activity. Four guys picked up four, poor Ellen and headed towards the kitchen car. Or are they gonna eat her? They're gonna eat Ellen? They're gonna have a little Ellen snack? They dropped her twice. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> How are you going to drop her with four fucking people? Uh, people took off in every direction in a mad scavenger hunt. I turned around and the mystery man was gone. Oh, shit. I had been sleeping with a vampire. I've slept with my share of losers in my time, but this had to be the worst. I really had to sign up with one of those background check services just as soon as I got back to the color and civilization. Darling, there you are. Come over here. Come quick. I ran to where he was standing. Another body was on the floor between the seats. Bill or Frank, I don't know which. I looked at the mystery man and back at the body. Somehow during our Agatha Christie dining room chat, Bill or Frank had drifted away and the vampire had gotten him. I'd been with Brandon the whole time. At least I was pretty sure I was. Did that mean that the vampire had been in the car the whole time? Maybe they really did turn into mist. Hell, I didn't know anything about vampires. I didn't even live in this century. I turned around to call out the others and realized we were alone in the car. Just me and... the vampire. I had to get the hell out of there and fast. The mystery man blocked the doors closest and the other one was way down at the other end of the car. It was fight or flight and somehow I had the feeling that either way I was going to come up short. Even Krav Maga wasn't going to help me now. He, was, he would probably just turn into a bat. To put it mildly, I was fucked. I turned to run and he quickly overcame me. I hit the floor hard and felt his hot breath on my throat. I tried to struggle, but it was too late. I felt his teeth sink into me with my lifeblood and began to drain from my body. I closed my eyes, ready to die. I was dying in 1939, the year before my mother was born. I heard a scream. It was Betty Sue. I recognized the voice. I opened my eyes so I could tell her to run. The world was back in color. I was on the floor in Grand Central Station. I could see my red hair sprawled out beside me. People were crowded around me and it hurt so bad. I looked down at my stomach and saw the dark wet spot on my black suit. Someone was pressing on it. Their hands were covered in blood. Did anybody see what happened? Someone asked. I did, another person replied. This lady walked through the doors with her wheeler behind her and bumped right into this guy with an eye patch. He just kept walking, right out the doors and then she fell. By the time I realized what happened, it was too late. He'd, been into, he'd blended into the crowd, and he was probably a couple of blocks away by then. Why, why would he do it? Betty Sue asked. Who the hell knows, lady? Welcome to New York. I heard the sirens in the distance and watched as I bled out into the Tennessee pink marble floor. My life flashed before my eyes, like strips in the funny paper. I wasn't going to make it. Somewhere in the recesses of my mind... I heard the gentle sound of a train and felt that motion that always made me sick. Only this time, it was luring me to sleep. I lifted my head up to look at the beautiful clock that is rumored to be made of pure opal. The clock that makes sure that thousands of people get to work on time every day. It was 739. 1939. I closed my eyes and let the train take me away. The end! I need to heat up more water.
What a miss. I'm grabbing liquid. I'm back. Allegedly. How's it go? That was pretty good. Apparently Windows thinks so too. Uh, I only did like the foreshadowing for about that. In the beginning, it did hint that she got stabbed. You get all that. Is that what happens when you're about to, you get murdered? You just have like a whole ass dream sequence? Alright, what do we got? Steel Deliverance. Alright. Here we go. Michael Thomas Knight, Steel Deliverance. Let me get a little of this hot water. Just pour, 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 pour some on the floor. Depends on your theology. That's like good nightmare fuel. You know, like, for like, you know, some people are like, conspiracy theories about being in a matrix or whatever. Just imagine that everything you're experiencing right now is just your near-death experience of the actual you. God is just your live stream sequence. Oh, shit. You just gotta learn how to dream harder, faster. You know what? We're changing the background, though. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this, Grandpa. The rain distorts my vision. Transposing dream into reality. Or reality to dream. I'm not sure which. It's 3.15 a.m. I stare out my bedroom window. My sleep interrupted. My sanity once again in question. Through darkness and sheets of rain, I watch the cars move slowly along the distant tracks. The grinding of steel on steel, the metallic squeaking, scraping, radiates through the stormy night as the train creeps along. The third rail brightens silhouettes of the train cars with a snap and crackle. Blue and white electric light spills out from under the cars and illuminates gray metal like a camera's flash. A moment later, a flash in the sky duplicates the light and smack, and a smack of thunder follows. I try to peer into the car windows, little gray squares from this distance. They're all they're dark and unrevealing. But I know eyes are staring out at me. I feel them like burning embers of a fading campfire, heat on my face. Seen or unseen, they exist and they call to me. Why? What task would they have me perform at such an ungodly hour? I stand at my second floor window, my face twisted with a distress and frozen in stone. Motionless and solid in the night, like a gargoyle perched upon a rooftop ledge. My mental answer is no, to any question this transporter of the spirit world would ask. The train picks up speed. The last car passes the parallel of my house, and the whistle cries not like a die-cast manufactured train, but like the souls in agonized harmony. Its last howl away in the distance screams, Back to hell with you. Oh, I'm sorry. It screams. Back to hell with you, I say. But that sound is cut short by a bright flash and a loud crack of thunder and shakes the foundation of my home. I return to my bed and lay for a time, unmoving. I drift back into sleep. My heart rate returns to normal, and my mind settles from the anxiety of my vision. When I fall into a deep sleep, I dream. I dream of souls going to limbo, transported by the flame-breathing locomotive. Spirits scream in the cars as the train barrels down the hot rails to hell. I dream of people who have ended their lives on the tracks, patiently waiting as the massive metal god plunges forward, baptizing them in their own blood in a violent steel deliverance. I then dream of a woman I once knew, a strange and carefree sort, a fallen angel who landed in my arms. I now realize she is the only one I will ever love. It is she who imposes upon this malevolent, malev this word always gets me for some reason, malevolent, malevolent hell train to summon me from my sleep. She lowers my attention and demands my presence. She calls, always at this time. October 3rd was the day we met. We fell into a whirlwind relationship, which ended a year later. For a full decade, I denied the invitation to see her again. I shall deny her no longer. Morning makes its subtle entrance into a gray-clad skies. As I head off to work, I can only think of her. 
I can think only of her on this gloomy day. She was very much like the passing storm clouds, unrestricted and all-encompassing. Her free spirit and spontaneity attracted me. The constraints of society could not bind her. The intention of others could not quell her wishes. Time or space, routines or rules, all were meaningless to her. Years later, she continues to defy reality. Her name was Cassandra. Our relationship was, from the start, a roller coaster ride of rebellion and recklessness, a love hate tug of war, a collision of emotions that exploded into bouts of vengeful, scarring fights, and episodes of passionate, all consuming lovemaking. Oh, another, we're, we're doing a lot of lovemaking here. Uh, a full year of euphoric highs and morose lows was all my mind could take. I was coming apart at the emotional seams. It was all my mental state could handle just to call her. I decided I couldn't take it anymore. We had to split up, and I had to tell her. I remember the night as if it was yesterday. On many occasions, Cassie, as I called her, I would walk, and I would walk to the tracks on the railroad line running through our town. The railways, the railway areas were draped with trees and vegetation, a mini jungle cutting through the center of suburbia. Between passing trains, the area was transformed into a slender sanctuary, quiet and isolated. Rarely would we see a soul. It was as far away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life as we could get. It was the third night of a fight that had started. For what reason, I could not say. Cassie left a brief message on my voicemail telling me to meet her at the Belrose train station at 9 p.m. Without a word spoken between us, we climbed down from the train platform onto the tracks, darting out of the station area and into the darkness. As soon as we were distanced from the station, Cassie started babbling about some pettiness that meant nothing. I cut her off. Cass, we have to talk. Her name just gets shorter and shorter the further we get in here. Next thing you know, he's just going to start calling her C. What the hell do you think we're doing? Have you been listening? No, this is serious. Listen. I shut my eyes and massaged my forehead between my thumb and fingers. I can't do this. Do what? She quipped. Us. I mean us. It's over, Cassie. As soon as I said the word, over, Cassie stopped walking. I stopped two steps later. Over? What do you mean, over? She grabbed me and spun me around to her face. She wanted to look, my, look in my eyes to gauge if I really meant what I was saying. I looked her straight in the face so she would know how serious I was. I kept my emotions at bay and tried to speak with conviction. I do love you. I think you, I think I love you. But I don't know if we're good for each other. I think we're not. For the first time since I'd met her, she looked vulnerable. Tears welled up on her lower eyelids, and her lips quivered. Not good for each other, she repeated in a soft, childlike voice. Not good for each other. No, that'd be, that'd be so cursed. If somebody responded to me like that, I would be like, yes, this is why. I'm just trying, I just need time away from you for a while, I said, trying to keep eye contact. You can't do this to me. To us. You promised to love me forever. I promised my love to you, she said. I know what I said, Cassie. I don't know what you said. It was all new. We were falling in love. But now we're falling out of love. It's about time one of us admits it. Look at us. Our lives are shattered. I haven't been showing up for work. I'm two months late paying the rent. You stopped going to art classes. It's not good. It's a woman, isn't it? Cass, it's, it's nothing like that, I argued. It's you. I don't want to see you anymore. That's it. It has nothing to do with anyone else or with anything else. This will be better for the both of us. Her hand went up to her face to cover her mouth. She gasped. Tears rolled from her eyes and down her fingers. Could it be that she really didn't see this coming? Did she really think our relationship was good? Is she a dumb... I'm sorry, that's not part of the book. That, that was me. I'm interjecting there. For the last six months, we hardly even talked. It was just fight, then fuck. Fight, then fuck. Then she truly looked surprised. Part of me wanted to grab her quivering body in my arms and hug her. Tell her I didn't mean it. Tell her I was wrong and we should be, be together. That I do love her with all my heart, and I'll never question that again. But I had to be strong. I had to come to this, f I had come this far, and I knew this was our only chance to clean, f at a clean break. 
I had to take the last few steps out of the hypothetical door and be done with her. I want the keys to my apartment back, I said. I hoped the finality of these words would be the last blow. She stared into my eyes, searching for a sign of remorse. I gave her none. She was broken. She was Logitech G-Hub device DPI set to 800. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I gave her none. She was broken. A lost child standing before me. It's okay, Mark. You can see other women if you want, but please just don't leave me. I have so many cups. So many cups. She reached shaking hands toward me. I backed away. I needed this to end. Words came to me, harsh words, like the fall of a guillotine blade. I barked out an icy sentence. Forget the keys. I'll just have the locks changed. <laughs> Damn. Just like say that out loud. You're supposed to think that kind of thing. You're not supposed to say it. Like that's actually a pro tip. Uh, change. Don't don't tell them you're changing the locks because then that that like, that's like a whole other thing. Cassie's whole body jumped. As, but this is a story. I'm oh, sorry. Cassie's whole body jumped as if a hiccup went through her as my words delivered a hard slap. She grabbed my collar. I pushed her back and her fingers came free. Sobbing hysterically, she rushed forward and grabbed onto my shirt again. I pushed her arm's length, and, but she held on. Please, Mark, no. She tugged and clawed. She meant never to let go. I pried her fingers from my shirt one by one, bending them all backwards. Mark, please don't leave me. I got her fingers loose and gave her a forceful shove. She sprawled to the ground hard. Tears shot from her eyes. She wailed as she crawled forward. I pulled my foot back. Then she reached for it. Goodbye, Cassie, I said. I turned my back to her and walked away leaving her lying on the ground in a pool of tears. She wailed even louder, her breath coming from deep inside, a guttural sound as if she were pouring all the emotion of her heart out through her lungs. I shuffled down the embankment into a space that led through a shrubbery. Through gasping cries, she screamed, Please, please, please! I continued to walk like a militant on a mission, knowing I was doing the right thing. She was the wild child. Uh. I'd like to party. And nothing was going to change that. The trait that originally threw me to her had turned to acid and eaten away my life. Had eaten away at my life. My mind and world were melting. I needed order in my life, and I wouldn't find it with her at my side. I knew this. I was far from the tracks and pressing my way through the brush. I figured it if I cut straight through, I could find a hole in the fence and come out on Granger Street. From there... I could get to Jericho Turnpike and take a bus back uptown. I heard Cassie's voice call out in the wind. Come back, please. Come back. I continued to the brush, pretending not to hear. Even though part of me wanted to run back to her, I heard her voice again, like an echo in the wind coming from multiple directions. My love is for you only, she shouted, and that's the way it will be for all eternity. If you won't have my love, no one will. The distant whistle of an approaching train made me think about what she had said. The distress about the breakup combined with those words aroused my concern. But I had to let it go. She would survive. She was a fighter. She'd hurt, but she'd get over it. The train whistle called again. This time it was more pronounced. Her words reverberated in my head. For all eternity, no one will. I heard the rumble of the locomotive engine. It was still off in the distance, but it carried through the night, drifting in the breeze. Then it hit me. Softly, but insistently. I stopped walking, thinking of her wor about her words again. Nah, I said. However, I couldn't shake the creepy feeling that was invading my mind. I looked over my shoulder and tried to shrug it off, but I couldn't. I turned and headed back, headed back the way I, back the way you came. I headed back the way I came. Oh my gosh. Back the way I had come, all the while denying she was capable. I have to do the, the, the goddamn finger thing right now. <laughs> Back the way I had came, all the way denying she was capable of the unspeakable. I had to check. I assured myself that she had already left and gone home, but I still had to check for my own peace of mind. The locomotive rumbled, growing to a steady roar. 
A sense of urgency overwhelmed me as I made my way through the brush, the bush. Thick vegetation surrounded me, disoriented. I pushed myself faster and harder. Twigs and branches smacked me in the face and scratched my arms. The train pushed faster and harder, matching my efforts. I felt the vibrations from the tracks in my feet, and the locomotive's wheels made intermittent shrills, screeches that grew louder with each cry. I made a last-ditch effort to free myself from the strangling shrubbery. I ran, the, ran, but barely moved. The foliage grabbed at me, purposely trying to hinder my advance. I broke free, spilling to the ground in the clearing. clearing. Rocks scraped my body, making, my, making me bloody as I tumbled. I jumped to my feet, looked up at the embankment, and witnessed my worst fear. Cassandra stood on the tracks between the rails. A light beam from the locomotive shined on her like a spotlight, and the deafening roar of the train blotted out my cries for her to run. She waited apathetically as the train closed the final gap. A moment before impact, she turned to me and mouthed the words, I love you. Then she disappeared. The massive speeding train pulverized her body. Parts of her flew in all directions. Small pieces of soft tissue hit me in the face and stuck to my skin. A piece of bone raced through the air and penetrated my leg like a steak knife. I looked down at the flesh hanging from it. It rained blood, and I screamed. Small droplets showered my skin like a fine hot mist, covering me and everything around me in red. I looked at my arm and dragged my fingers to the blood, making a swirling line on my arm. I lifted my finger and looked at the red liquid, unsure or in denial about what it was. I heard the squeal of the train's brakes as it passed, as it quickly passed me and moved off into the distance. I looked up and saw pieces of Cassandra everywhere. I raced around collecting what I could see, a foot or hand, part of a leg. Did I have some idea of putting her back together? The world spun into darkness, and I passed out. Later, the police told me that when they arrived, I was sitting Indian-style, rocking and cradling a heap of unrecognizable flesh. Now it is ten years later, October 3rd at 2 a.m. I head up the stairs at the Belrose train station and onto the platform. At this hour, there is rarely a soul seen at the station, especially on a weeknight. I scan the area to ensure my stealth and jump from the platform to the tracks. I walk the long journey for the first time in many years, as if I were another person in another life, or as a story from a long-forgotten book. The railroad ties pass under my feet at a steady rhythm. The dark, ominous trees sway overhead in the autumn winds. Occasionally, I pass a familiar signpost and a sweet memory tries to purge my heart. This is where Cassandra and I first made out, sitting upon that fallen tree. I scattered my thoughts, trying to block these memories. I bow my head and concentrate on the passing parallels, sometimes counting them to occupy my mind. I'll show her no emotion on this night. It's over between us, and she must know this. I must get on with living. I'm overwhelmed when I arrive at the place I last saw her. Dread intrudes upon my soul, and my emotions lock a grip of desperation upon my heart. All the love, the magic moments, the experiences we had surface at once. A maelstrom of sights and sounds flash before my eyes and in my ears. Tears course down my cheeks in a silent cry. The dark power of her engulfs me, like a black cloud swallowing a small plane. She's a violent storm that will not recede. I feel her presence, and, and it demands a reckoning. She is in the trees and on the tracks, her ambience plastered to my skin and riding along the wind simultaneously. Simultaneously. She's here, yet she evades me. What kind of evil hell bitch game is this? Is this her revenge? A torn man with a torn heart? Is that what she wishes to leave upon here upon these empty tracks? I scream at the trees, at the sky, at the wind, and perhaps at nothing at all. Where the hell are you? I'm here. Show yourself. I pause a moment. Cassandra, I know you're here. I can feel you. I smell you. I taste you. The wind continues. Where are you? Sorry, I couldn't help. The wind continues to whip fallen leaves into small swirling communities. Tree branches sway like giant waving hands greeting friends on opposite sides of the tracks. I stand alone, no one to greet me, 
a jilted lover waiting in vain. Has this all been my imagination? Am I alone here wishing for something impossible? I scream for her again. This time so loudly it causes the veins of my temples to bulge. Cassie, I love you. Show yourself to me, damn it. I'm here for you, because I love you. Won't you even talk to me face to face? At once, the wind stops. The leaves stop, their incessant swirling. Trees cease waving, and the black-gray sky halts its relentless whispering. It's as if the natural world... It's as if the natural world has fallen silent to stare in disbelief at the ranting lunatic in its midst. It's so quiet, it seems I can hear for miles. As if in answering to my cries, I hear one lonely howl of a train whistle scream through the sleeping town. Now I know she's coming, and I wait patiently. A pinpoint of light appears at a distance on the track line. The metallic beast thunders forward, piercing nature's hush with a quaking, with quaking growl. I imagine how she'll look when the train stops and my dear Cassandra comes strolling out of one of the, from one of the cars. She will strike a hard glance at me, punishing, but with a trance of longing and eagerness. I'll help her down from the steps and we'll walk through the patch, the path along the tracks as we did years ago in our private, slender suburban sanctuary. I will not allow her to leave me again. We will be together. We were meant for each other. The train advances towards me, the circle of light growing like the rising moon. The tracks rumble under my feet, and my heart beats its rhythm. Anticipation intensifies with the thought of being once again with my love. I stare at the growing light and notice something odd. The silhouette is breaking its encompassing beam like an eclipse. The train races towards me, and the sight becomes even clearer. I now see Cassie. The outline of her body sways in a seductive dance as she rides the front of the locomotive, like a living masthead. Her hands glide along her sides, and she clutches her breasts. Her other hand moves between her snow-white thighs. She stretches and bends, twists and rises, her black hair whipping chaotically from the speed of the train racing forward. She grabs and rips at her flowing, flowing white dress to expose her breasts and stomach. She arches her back in ecstasy. She puckers her lips for a kiss and reaches her arms forward to receive me in her embrace. Enthralled and seduced, I open my arms for her. The locomotive closes the final gap, bringing, me back to lo bringing my love back to me. My Cassandra, we will now and forever be together. What's this? Okay. We got Justin Hunter the Willing. Ryan gripped the cold corrugated metal of the rusted boxcar door. The train was already beginning to move. His hands, black with grime, his knuckles standing out white against the skin of his emaciated flesh, fought against losing his grip. The metal of the poorly mended door flexed outward, threatening to drop him to the ground and back into the cold night. He had spent the last three nights sleeping out in the open, waiting for the next train to arrive. His muscles felt stiff and frozen. The promise of an old boxcar to sleep in, walls to protect him from... I think this is going to get really vulgar very fast. <laughs> from the wind and a roof to save him from the rain. Seemed uh, like such a godsend in the night of a five... Oh my god. Seemed as much of a godsend as a night in a five-star resort. We got man. Getting into a box car. The train picked up speed. His left hand slipped on the metal and slicing a deep furrow across his palm. He groaned and heaved with all the strength he had left. He threw his right leg onto the box car and pulled himself inside. The piecemeal door shut behind them with a loud clang. Ryan lay on his back and breathed heavily. He felt a thin layer of dirt beneath his head. A slight wisp of breeze, biting cold, crossed over his frame from a crack in the door. He had no strength left to pull deeper into the boxcar and away from the frigid air. He fell asleep where he lay. The train rumbled on. He woke to the waning sunset. The sky was pink of the, of the horizon, blending into a deep purple before allowing the blackness of night to overtake it all. 
He rolled over into his side, his body protesting every mo moment of movement. From what he could tell, he had stayed in the same position the whole time he slept. He swept away a stick that had left a deep imprint in his back from his uncomfortable sleep. As if he planned to sleep in the same place again, he didn't want to suffer it all over again. Ryan rubbed his face with his hands. He lost himself in reverie, but started when he caught a flash of movement from the far corner of the boxcar. He's awake now, isn't he? The voice was gravelly and rough. Slept a long time, my son. Must have had it pretty rough out there. The man stood and moved into the last ray of dying light. He was old, yet the age was a hard thing to tell from life on the rails. Hard living ages a person fast. He wore dirty clothes, layered so thickly that Ryan couldn't make a good guess at what the man's build. He didn't like what the, the way the man was looking at him, sizing him up. Ryan watched the man's eyes travel several times up and down his body, making him feel small and weak. Young, the man said. How old are you, son? Twenty, Ryan said, shifting his body up in a sitting position. Bah, the man laughed. You can't be more than fifteen. You've got those scrawny arms and legs. No man, no man muscle on you. What do you want? The man laughed again. The sound was harsh. <laughs> as if the man's lungs were caked with wet mucus. Broken only by barking mirth. It was painful for Ryan to hear. Nothing. I don't want anything you're unwilling to give. I just thought we could pass the time here for a while. I know these rails, and I know there's, there's this isn't going to be stopping for a long run. You've got two drivers up there taking turns sleeping and turning the, running the train. It's going to be just you and me for a long stretch. Ryan tried to hold the man's stare, but felt so uncomfortable he looked at the floor. You may be young, but I bet you know a thing or two. I bet you've been broken and real good. You know how this works on the rails. I know how it works, Ryan said. I'll fight you if you try anything. You fight me? The man's voice rose to a creaky octave with the question. This is my car, boy. You want to ride in here, you have to pay the toll. I'll see that you're broken in proper. Roll over and pay. I won't let you. Suit yourself, the old man said, shrugging. Get out. He pulled back the boxcar door. A cold blast of wind, flecked with snow, chilled Ryan through his meager clothing. The man smiled broadly, his brown and broken teeth pressed taut in his grinning maw. Ryan felt the cold bite to the bone. He hadn't eaten in days. He knew he had no strength to fight. His body shivered as he took one last look at this filthy roached attacker. Then he rolled over on his stomach and lay still. Hold on, let me glance this. I, know, I think, yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Go ahead, Ryan said. His voice came out so soft that it was almost inaudible. The man laughed his foul, wet bark again. Ryan heard him unbuckle his belt. Then hard hands jerked his pants down to his ankles. His boxer briefs came down next. The man, this is not good if you're going to sleep. The, the man tore them into his haste to pull them down. Ryan felt his mind lapse into memories as he did whenever this happened to him. It was far from the first time. He thought of his room at his mother's house. He thought of sinking into the soft mattress of his bed. He remembered the smell of his pillows. He, he felt himself sink into the warmth and coziness of the safety and love. And then the memories turned on him. They always did. He remembered his mother's boyfriend, the one with the large sagging pouch and the thick hairy arms, the one who would wander into his room after his mother fell asleep, the one who took, his, took away his safety, the one of, of who made him run away in the first place. The hatred he felt for the man startled him back into reality. The ragged vagrant had finished. He was breathing heavily, his chest rattling wetly with each intake of air. Sweat iced his brow. He sat down near the door of the boxcar and lit the remaining half-inch of cigarette. Of a cigarette. He held it out to Ryan, offering him a drag. Ryan shook his head. He rolled onto his back and pulled his pants back on, throwing the torn remains of his boxers into a corner of the car. His own breathing was calm. He, in fact, felt calm. There was a night at home when he had prepared himself for his mother's boyfriend. During dinner, the man had patted him on the bottom with his ape-like hand, when his mother wasn't looking. He whispered in his ear that night that he was going to tear into his mother, 
tear into his mother, then tear into him. After washing the dishes, Ryan stole a long kitchen knife and hid it beneath his pillow. He pretended to sleep as he heard his mother and his boyfriend having sex in the next room. He waited several hours into the night until he heard the sound of the bed springs creak to the wall, telling him that his mother's boyfriend had risen and was coming for him. He listened to the soft thudding of feet as his attacker made his way to his bedroom. He heard his breathing quicken with excitement through the cheap pressed wood door. The door opened and a large massive man filled the doorway. He was fully nude. Ryan felt his skin crawl as the man touched his ankle beneath the sheets. The man was strong. Ryan felt himself pulled from under the covers and flopped onto his mattress. The man moved forward to mount him. Ryan, the steel flashing in the reflected moonlight, slashed out with a knife, cutting his mother's boyfriend across his ample stomach. The man bellowed. Ryan tried to cut him again, but the man gasped, grasped his wrist, almost breaking his bones with his grip. The man punched him hard in the face. Ryan's vision blackened at the edges. He could hear his mother screaming in the background. Ryan's spirit soared as he thought she was there to save him. He thought she would get rid of the man who was hurting him. But when, he, when his pain began to clear, he realized that she was screaming at him. She was daubing her boyfriend's wound with a towel, begging him for forgiveness, while she turned her head towards Ryan and hurled rebukes at him. He held the blood-dripping knife in his hand and looked, at his, looked into his mother's eyes. He didn't recognize her anymore, and worse... She didn't seem to recognize him. He left that night. A new day had dawned in the boxcar. Ryan sat in the doorway, his legs dangling over the side, and watched the thick forest of birch trees fly by him. He held the kitchen knife in his hand. The blade showed nicks, bent slightly at the handle and definitely not as sharp, but it would do. It would do the job just fine. The man slept behind him. Soon he would wake up and Ryan would go to work. He would work on the man like he had, many, had so many others. His mother wasn't there to stop him. Not this time. Not ever again. He listened to the gentle clacking of the wheels of the rails. It lulled him. Soon the man would wake up. But there was time for this. There was time to watch the gentle snow fall. Time to gaze upon the trees. Their limbs sagging with the weight of the billowing snow. And I don't know it was dark, but I like the the plot, the, the twist, if you will. That used to be a massive thing. Is uh, uh, the uh, hobo essay and R. The punch came out of nowhere. Wait, what was this one? Oh, this one's fun. I think. <laughs> All right, we'll run that the hard way. Bridget Kephart, Summer Train. The punch came out of nowhere, <clears throat> smashing against Colby's arm and nearly knocking him off the log where he sat. The blow accompanied by the taunting chant, Pinch, poke, owe me a coke. Oh, douchebag, Colby said. He rolled up his sleeve of his Macklemore t-shirt to reveal a fist... Damn, this shit's so 20-whatever year it came on. <laughs> Macklemore t-shirt to reveal a fist-sized spot reddening on his skin. Punch me again, and I'll owe you a fat lip, Colby said as he rose to his feet. He poked a finger into Max's chest, jabbing the line of Max's t-shirt, which read, I bought awesome, what do you bring? I brought awesome, what did you bring? That's a classic. Ugh, hey. I saw them first, Max said, dancing off to the left and out of Colby's reach. No need to get testes. Max had the bulk of a small bull. He played football for their school, and Colby honestly didn't think Max realized his own strength. Strength. Colby followed the line of Max's finger to where it pointed up the hill at two figures. One was Sarah, a blonde girl in a raspberry tank top and jean shorts who carried a navy blue backpack slung casually over her shoulder. Accompanying her was Darius, the youngest of their group. He wore jeans and a long sleeve striped shirt with his own backpack slung over his shoulder. His clothing looked out of place for summer, but was typical for Darius. Rolling clouds in the dark sky crept closer to the stretch of the woods. About time, Colby called. We need to catch the train before the train starts. It's my fault, said Darius, pushing his glasses up his nose. Mom decided it was 
Today was the day I needed to go over the accelerated learning classes the school thinks I should enroll in. She woke me up at six and didn't leave for the clinic until almost nine. They exchanged hand slaps, fist bumps, and finger flicks before they all turned as one and headed towards the tracks. We already missed the hot air balloons at the fair opening, Colby said, looking down at his watch. But we might be able to hit the midway before the rain re rains out. They heard a low, forlorn call not a minute later. Looking at each other, they took off at a run. The horn always sounded as if it slowed through town, which meant they had about seven minutes before the train rolled through the meadow they were currently crossing. They'd have to get across the track so they could hide before the engine roar car rolled past. It was the only way to get to the get on the boxcars without discovery by a conductor. There was barely enough time to crouch down and hide before the first of the cars settled in a slow slumbering pass. There had been rare occasions when they'd share their car with a hobo, but they had gotten to know the boxcars were carrying that day. There would have been a unanimous vote to skip the Vigo County Fair. Sarah was the first to deal Oh my gosh. Sarah was the first to feel the drops of rain hit her cheeks as they patiently waited for the section of the train where the open box cars began. She raised her hand on her face and wiped. It's already starting to rain. At least we'll be on the train if it starts to pour, Max said. Then he stood and took off at a trot towards the passing train. Colby spun it past him, paced the train for a minute, then grabbed the handle on the side of the door and pulled himself up into the open doorway. Sarah was right behind him. He tugged her by the arm, dragging her in and out of the way just as Darius reached the opening. Darius was a little guy, but the way he handled himself made up for it. He and Max played the on the same football team. He could run fast, jump high, and kick like a mule, which is why he was not only the kicker for the team, but also the best, their best running back. Ironically, he didn't really like sports that much. It was prodding from his dad that kept him on the team. He would have preferred the company of a good book than the rampant smells of body odor that emanated the junior high locker room. He jogged aside the opening, feeling his heart speed up as he lunged for the door. The ground was barely wet, but he felt his feet slip, and then he slid sideways as a large chunk of white limestone rushed towards his face. With a startled cry, his hands flew out in front of him. A rush of air pushed past him, then seemed to tug him downwards as the train swept indifferently along in the metal, its metal highway. He felt a jolt of his backpack snag, and he flew up and through the air, sailing past Colby to sprawling in the middle of a boxcar. Max flung himself to the opening a second later. Oh shit, there he said. Oh shit, dude, I almost died. I saw my whole life flash before my eyes. You almost made me fall off, asswipe, Max said, brushing himself off. You're 11. How much life could you have been seen rushing past your eyes? Colby said, rolling his eyes toward forward toward Sarah. Oh, I'm getting worse, bro. <laughs> this is my last one. Uh, where she swung her backpack around and dug through its contents. You saved my life, Darius said. Whatever, Max said as he dropped to his knees next to Sarah. Did you bring us lunch? Dad was a Boy Scout. He taught me to always be prepared, she said pulling an apple from the pack and tossing it to Max. Good, because I'm hungry. He caught the apple in his hands and frowned. Don't you have anything good? In some cultures, if you save a life, you're responsible for that person for the rest of their life, Darius said. In your dreams, running man, in your dreams, Max said as he tossed the apple back to Sarah. What about a candy bar or a sandwich? I'll take a steak or some fried chicken. I'm not picky. He already ate at my house. He eats like a friggin' horse, Colby said, sliding down the wall of the boxcar to land between Sarah and Darius. Hey, I'm a growing boy. Max patted his belly, then for good measure patted his ass. He was solid. Sarah smothered a laugh and tossed him a Milky Way, then retrieved the sandwiches she had tucked into the bag. We got egg salad, turkey, bologna, tuna, and there's a plain cheese and... She tossed the last one to Darius who caught it and grinned. Peanut butter and jelly for Brainiac over there. They dug into their small feast as the train rhythmically thudded down the tracks. It was loud, and yet silent for the most part. On occasion, someone would let a joke fall between them. Otherwise, the hum of the train put them into a semi-conscious lull. Outside the sky had grown dark as night, and the wind blew through the doors in a gust. 
blowing drops of rain into the open doorway. The four crept closer together as the storm raged until they were sitting in a small tight circle next to the front wall of the boxcar. A blinding flashlight caused them all to jump, and followed by a low-barreled roar as a thunder rolled across the train. Did anybody notice what the train is carrying? Darius said, looking off towards the back of the boxcar. In truth, nobody had. They looked, they looked now. There were rows of long boxes stacked three high. On each end of the boxes was a large tattoo print. Batesville Coffin Company, since 1884. The boxes looked withered, old and used like they'd been dug out of the ground sometime in a not-so-distant past. Ah, I wonder if those are from the graves they dug out in the Sandusky place. The paper had a big write-up about how they were going to move the old cemetery. Some controversy about it not being legal to move the bodies without family approval or something, Colby said. Suddenly, Max rolled onto his back with a groan lifted his right leg up to his chest, and a verbato rumble erupted from his backside. Oh, this nigga just farted. All right. Sarah squealed and scooted crab-style away from Max, while Kobe kicked him in the leg. Darius didn't move. He just sat and stared at the boxes in the back of the car. Rude, 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 Sarah said. A man's gotta do what a man's gotta do, he said. Hey, Cole, do farts ever have lumps? In answer, Kobe gave him another kick to the leg. There was another flicker of light, followed by a boom. Colby looked at his watch. The train was moving slowly due to the storm. They probably still had 20 minutes before they hit the city limits where the Vigo County, where the Vigo County Fair was being held. The day was shot with all the rain. Still, he'd prefer to get off this train as soon as possible. Do you smell that? Darius said. Max's fart, Sarah said, and then broke into a fit of giggles. No. Darius shook his head and then tilted it as if listening. I noticed it before. I th think it's coming from back there. Smell like dirt? Dead bodies? Max asked. You the poo? Smells like something died, yeah. So let's go look, Max said, rolling to his feet. He pointed at Colby. You go first, fearless leader. Sarah fished a flashlight out of her backpack. Then she rolled to her knees used the back wall for leverage, and hauled herself to a standing position. I'll go first. I got the light. She's got bigger balls than you, my friend, Max said to Colby. Those are his balls, Darius said. There was a round of snickers. We could get off this car and pick another. The train's going slow enough, Darius suggested. Where is your sense of adventure, Max said. He pushed Sarah ahead of him as she guided her. As if guiding her, sorry. I let it out of my other... I left it in my other shorts, you know. The clean pair I'm going to need if we find anything gross back there. They moved slowly. The motion of the train made it a bit like walking on a boat on the sea. Kind of rolling on occasion, even though the speed was relatively slow. Sarah, did, Sarah didn't want to touch it, but her hand brushed the bo coffin box. So she used it to steady herself as she made her way down the center aisle between the caskets. There were 12 boxes, all marked Batesville Coffin Company. All looking freshly removed from the ground. There should be more of these, Colby said quietly. I think I read there were 25 to 50, 20 to 50 graves being moved. They weren't sure because some of the old markers had been worn away to nothing. When did you start reading, Einstein? Max asked quietly. Sometimes my parents make me sit with them at breakfast and read the paper. It's a lost art. You wouldn't understand. Shh. Do you hear that? Sarah asked. Hear what? Darius asked. Darius ass asked. The lighting was so bright and blinding, they jumped as if puppets connected by the same string, then pushed close together in a huddle as the sound of thunder rippled through the boxcar, echoing off its side and shaking the entire train on its tracks. Jeez, I think that hit the train. You can smell it now, though, right? Darius asked. I smell something, Sarah said, inching forward. I think I shit my pants. That might be what you smell, Max said. Really, Max? Why don't you relax with the jokes for a minute, man? Colby said, feeling the tension in his shoulders. His nerves were standing on end from the last blast of lightning, and it felt like he had had strings of wire laced through his body. Getting ready to explode at any moment. Another lightning strike might make his body aflame. Might set his body aflame. Cipriani.
Yeah, 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 Cipriani. Another joke from Max, and he might explode in a different manner. One thing was certain. He didn't want Sarah in front, of, in front with the light. He moved forward and reached out to remove it from her hand. I got it, she said, and stepped forward, stepped further into the darkness. She swept the beam across the floor and up the boxes. At the end of the aisle was another gap before the back wall of the boxcar. She swept the beam across the walls, over the ceiling, brought it down, and crossed the floor. The smell was stronger. The light beam passed a discolored lump in the back corner, and she drew the light back across it. Across it. She stabbed the beam for, for, uh, toward it, and then made a circle, bringing the others to his attention. What is it? Darius asked. She shrugged. Can't tell from here. Might not be what smells either. So get closer, Max said. She handed him the light and stepped back. You get closer. I think I see something moving over there. What do you mean, something moving? She shrugged and turned her wide blue eyes towards Colby and said, like a shadow or something. Darius pushed forward, one finger positioned on the bridge of his glasses as if bringing the lens closer to his face would give him a better look at what was beyond the circle of light. His brown eyes showed too much of the white of his eyes and looked comical in the darkness of the boxcar. Max shined the flashlight under, up under Darius's chin and everyone broke into a fit of giggles. giggles. It wasn't a fun fit of giggles, the kind that came out of something really funny being said or done and worked its way into the body, becoming irresistible. It wasn't that kind of giggle at all. It was the kind of giggle that comes from embarrassment, fear, uncertainty. The kind that masks something else resting just below the surface, as if to do something other than giggle at that uncertain... Why is... Why? <laughs> the kind that masks something else resting just below the surface, as if doing anything other than giggling at that certain... At the uncertainty would cause something too horrible to be named to become real. So... We giggle and pretend. This isn't really so bad. It was that kind of giggle. It was just enough to snap the fragile hold Colby had in his self-control. He snatched the light from Max and stomped towards the dark mass in the corner. It was moving. The remains of a carcass abuzz with flies, its fur moving with a death pulse under its skin. Colby held his nose and put the light closer. I think it's a cat, he said. Max came forward and sleeved up. Sleeve up over his nose, he crouched next to the carcass and poked it with a piece of wood he found lying on the floor. The fly surrounding the body rose like a thick cloud and seemed to grow and expand, then become thin and ghastly, ghostly for a moment, finally drifting back to the remains like a wave rolling back into the ocean. Quit that! What's wrong with you? Colby said, nudging Max away from the body. Max rocked back on his heels, one hand splayed to stop him from landing on his butt. His hand landed in a sticky substance. From the... What? Oh. His hand landed in a sticky substance. From the muttered gross that escaped his lips to the putrid waft of stench that rose from the puddle, Max felt his stomach muscles clench in response without his will. He heaved, spilling chicken salad amid the swirls of Milky Way and a heavy stream of mucus. Colby jumped back. Jesus, Max. Oh, Jesus, Max. I like to imagine that's goofy. Uh, Darius and Sarah, 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 Darius and Sarah had come close and now jumped back as well. Max huddled in a single beam of light spilling from the flashlight. His body shook again, and they heard a splash as a newly expunged food joined the pile, other pile on the floor. He held out one hand, the one he had stuck into the goo, and struggled to his feet. Something dropped from his hand, disappearing back into the darkness of the floor. God, please tell me you have a handy wipe, bleach, a towel, anything in your backpack, Max said, holding his goo-covered hand. Flipping open her cell phone, Sarah used his light and disappeared between the boxes. She returned a moment later, carrying a small hand towel and a bottle of water. Her backpack repositioned over her shoulder, in case she, they needed it again. This is the best I can do, she said, handing over the items. A new smell joined the smell of death. A, mar a marriage of sweet... Predigested food, stomach bile, dirt and mold, and other putrid, unidentifiable scent. If pushed, Colby might have thought of it as liquefied and rotting guts. Max poured the water over his hand and sto stomach, still heaving into a wretch, but not climaxing to actual vomit. He poured and wiped and poured and wiped, 
water dripping to the floor and adding to the already nasty thickness coating the floor of the boxcar. I like the idea of, like, the people that unload this. They're just like, what the fuck is this? Why what, Why is there a dead cat? And, and why, why is there just vomit everywhere? <laughs> this is gross. Then Max tossed uh, the back, the small hand towel down to the corner as well, adding to the pile of trash. You don't want that towel back, believe me. Darius held his nose, standing at the edge of the light. Another burst of light flashed through the car and backlit him. A dark shadow in the light, looking like a negative in a life-size shot from a cam camera. I'm getting out of here, Max said. Out of here where? Colby said. Off this train. Something's not right here, Max said. What's, uh, what was that stuff? Sarah said. Cat guts? Max shrugged. I lost my appetite for the fare. Here, let me have the light, Darius said, gently removing the flashlight from Colby's hand. He held his nose and moved closer to the cat. He gagged, gave a single dry heave, <laughs> and clamped down on his mouth. <laughs> Sorry. That actually broke my brain, too. Um, he moved the beam across the dead cat to the vomit and then to the goo with the handprint in it. Logic told him the pool of slime came from the body of the critter lying at his feet. It allowed the beam of light to trace the outline of the pool and the puddle. The slick was leading away from the animal. He trailed the beam across the floor, following the slickness as it traced into the darkness towards the end of the one coffin box, where a thick trail of wetness seemed to be oozing from the crate. Aw, oh, dare. Why did you have to do that? It made me puke thinking it was cat guts. Are you telling me it was one of those dead bodies is leaking? I'm not saying anything. You don't have to be Sherlock to figure out where the goo is oozing out of the box, though. Shouldn't there be an embalming smell to this? Sarah asked. Not necessarily, Darius said, moving away and handing the flashlight back to Colby. Smell that sweet scent? Almost like flowers? It's probably lavender. It combines, it combines with turpentine as a preservative. Lavender to help hide the, in any odors. Then again, not everybody was wealthy enough to, for formal embalming. They'd be lucky to get it. Lucky if they got a box to go on the ground. Why do you even know this stuff? Colby asked. I am the son of two African-American doctors in a family who's had few college graduates. It's not like I get a choice. Some of the knowledge is absorbed through osmosis. Yeah, well, I've had enough creepy shit for one day. Max, <laughs> Max made a move to shuffle back past them. You guys go on without me. I'll walk back along the tracks once the train has passed. You can't go out there in this storm. Sarah grabbed his arm. Max fixed on the dark smudge against the left side of his nose. Max fixed on a dark smudge against the left side of her nose for a moment, wondering where she had picked up the mark. The boxcar was filthy. She could have gotten it anywhere. He reached out and touched her nose, giving it a wipe. The jokes are always about Sarah and, Colby be a, Sarah and Colby being a couple, but they really weren't. And recently, Max had the bigger crush on her. For a moment, he forgot that he wanted to get off the train. If Sarah wanted to stay, then he'd stay. She was right. It was raining, after all. He'd be an idiot not to get off this train. You got something on your face, he said. Sarah smiled. A series of flashes illuminated the car, flickering fast, catching each of them in the process of something, some movement like a cartoon strip or still shots from a movie reel. They were slow dancers. Caught in the color spray of a disco ball. The thunder was one continuous rumble, shaking the air around them as time seemed to pass slowly. Five seconds. Ten seconds. Fifteen seconds. And then silence. Followed by plink, plink, plink. They looked for toward the roof. It sounded as if the car had sprung a leak. They listened as the rhythmic plink, plink, plink continued. Then the pattern changed. Plink, plink, plink. Pause? Plink, plink, plink. Like a single finger tapping out of rhythm. That's just weird, Max finally said. The rain had stopped. Colby didn't know what Max thought was weird. The sound coming to them, or the storm seemed to have stopped. There was a greenish glow all around them. Coming from the sky outside and moving through the boxcar. Coming... Oh, so what the fuck? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Permeating the air as the temperature dropped rapidly and took on the eerie calm. Too cold for a midsummer day. Too quiet for the space after such a violent storm. Too dark for an early July morning. A long, low, barely audible squeak, sounding a bit like a whistle, broke the silence. Darius whispered. I think they're evil spirits living in Max's butt. Sarah giggled. Max held up a hand. 
That didn't come from me. Colby swept a light beam across the floor at their feet, then up the sides of the box that had been leaking of the foul-smelling gunk. There was a scratch, followed by a whispered groan. The lid appeared to slide and shift, dancing within the shadows, and they accompanied by the rusty creak of the boxcar doors beginning to slide shut. They began to run, first in a clumsy Three Stooges shuffle, bumping into each other, then straightening out to make a direct line towards the slowly closing door. No one had noticed the train had stopped. Darius flew out of the door first, startling the conductor who had come down the line and was now in the process of closing the boxcar door. He was followed in quick succession by Max, who hit the ground and stumbled, Sarah, who almost tumbled over him, and then Colby, who flew over both, went down to his knees and then quickly resumed his footing. They took off for the tree line along the tracks, like a flock of geese being chased by rabbit dogs, and didn't stop running until they were several yards into the woods. The rain started up again. In the distance, they heard the low moan of the train whistle, and the rusty sound of steel against steel as the wheels of the train began to move, down, move on down the tracks. They had spent their summer jumping trains into town. This was, one was the last train they'd ride that year. Yeah. I'll teach you to ride a fucking train, bro. No train and bow. Well. This concludes reading. 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 I'm gonna... End here. Uh, what am I thinking? It's 2 a.m. Where's your wallet? I'm going to make a little journey out of here myself. I hope everyone has a lovely evening, day, or night. Um, Actually, I don't want to use the regular ending because it'll just be loud as shit. It'll be... You know what? Fuck it. We're just going to be loud. Everyone have a good one. Bye.